Um, this is a beautiful church, so once again, thank you to the pastor for allowing us uh, to use this. This is really beautiful. And thank you all for being here tonight and, and for caring enough to uh, take the time and, um, and listen and participate and be active. I always begin my remarks with a disclaimer, and that disclaimer is this. If anybody here came hoping to hear a balanced presentation, then they're going to be sorely disappointed. I say this because a lot of the things that you're about to hear tonight are difficult to hear. And also because I don't believe that a balanced presentation on this topic is possible. Anybody that cares enough to speak about this probably has a very strong opinion one way or the other. Um, almost everybody has feelings and strong emotions on this issue one way or the other. For me, it's deeply personal. And the issue itself is not a balanced issue. There is no balance in this issue. So therefore, I say this because there, there cannot be a balanced presentation on this. And I think if anybody claims that their presentation is balanced, they're either misleading themselves or they're misleading their audience. This whole issue of Israel and Palestine is, is covered in so much myth. And there's so much, um, there's so much double standard when people talk about this issue. And I'll give you two examples. I don't know if you heard Bibi Netanyahu's speech at the United Nations. I heard it, not live, but after he uh, actually delivered it. And he, began, and he began it with probably the two most striking examples of uh, myth and double standard. And he began by talking about um, the right of return of the Jews to their ancient homeland. And of course, the Jews that returned, so-called, uh, returned to their homeland were not exactly the same Jews who were expelled from their homeland, right? Because these were expelled a couple of thousand years before that. These were not their descendants either, because they, this has been, this has been a very long time. So these are people, the people that actually came back, so to speak, are people that claim some kind of a heritage, some kind of a connection, a relationship to the ancient Hebrews. And they claimed that they had the right to return to their homeland, and this, was, this is what Zionism was about, and this was, this was you know, accepted by the world as the right. They had the right to return. Now, if we talk about the right of return of one nation, you'd expect that there would be, if we accept it as a, as a principle, then you'd expect that we'd accept it in general across the board. Yet when people talk about the right of return of Palestinians to their homeland, suddenly a red line comes up and everybody says, no, we can't talk about the right of return of the Palestinians. This has to be taken off the table. This is not negotiable. The right of return of the Palestinians is not acceptable. What's interesting about that is that the right of return of the Palestinians, we're talking about, quite often we talk about the actual people who had to leave their homes. And if they had already passed away, then we're talking about their direct descendants, people who still have the keys and the deeds to their homes, and quite often can go to the very spot where a village existed, where today there might be a highway, and will point out the mosque, and will point out the well, and will point out the door to their home. Yet they do not enjoy the right to return. So obviously, this is a double standard of immense proportions. The other thing B.B. talked about right off as he started was about King David, who reigned some 3,000 years ago, and, you know, and here we are today as his descendants. What's interesting is, besides the fact that there is no historical evidence that King David ever existed, <coughs> outside the Bible, which of course is not a historical document, um, and Israeli archaeologists have all but turned up the entire country to find proof that he ever existed. Today, as we speak, an entire town, an entire community is being kicked out of their homes and forced into exile through violence in order to prove that King David existed in a place called Silwan. It's a community of 50,000 people right outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. Yet the world sees nothing wrong with this. American money is poured into this project to build what is called the new city of David, 
an archaeological park, and a community of 50,000 Palestinians has to be terrorized in order to leave. Their homes are being destroyed in order to make this point, this fictional, mythical connection between the ancient kingdom of King David and today's Israel. So these are just two examples. And it was interesting that Bibi Netanyahu decided to kick off his speech at the United Nations with these two things. Um, but what, I, what, what I'd like to do today is just begin with a little bit of history. And if you go ahead, hit the first slide. Thank you. People talk about the fact that this conflict, the, the conflict in the Holy Land, the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians has been around for so long that it's really not something anybody can ever solve. It's been going on for thousands of years. People have been killing each other there forever. This is not true. And a good place to start, if we're going to talk about how this conflict began, a good place to start would be on the 29th of November, 1947 the day that the United Nations accepted the resolution to partition Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. And this ridiculous map is what they came up with. Now when you look at this map, before, before you even hear about the details, before you even touch on the details of this map, just by looking at it, it's, it's unbelievable that anybody expected that this would work. And of course, this didn't even last one day. In 1947, there were two communities living parallel lives. We had the Jewish community that numbered about half a million, maybe a little bit less than half a million, that were expecting and hoping to become a state. And you had the Arab community, the Palestinian Arab community, of about a million and a half people who were also in the process and had the expectation of becoming a state. Yet when the United Nations came up with this ridiculous plan, they chose to give the larger portion of the country to the smaller community, to the Jewish community. And the smaller portion of the land to the larger community. And then people said, and to this day you hear people say, see, the Arabs, the Palestinians, did not accept the partition plan, so all this is their fault. Is anybody mad enough to think that they would accept this? Would anybody in their, Palestine, in their place have accepted something like this? Obviously not. And obviously, like I said, this did not last even a single day. Because as soon as the resolution was accepted, the Zionist forces, what was called the Haganah, the Palmach, began a massive campaign of ethnic cleansing. Now the story that we hear, the myth that we're told about 1947, and I heard it once again today, earlier today, at the Seattle Times, is that in 1947, after the United Nations finally recognized the right of the Jewish people to have their own state, the Arab armies attacked, intending to destroy this fledgling state, this young Jewish community. And this is only several years after the Nazi Holocaust. Yet somehow, between the end of 1947 and the end of 1948, the Zionist forces were able to conquer almost 80% of the country, destroy over 500 towns and villages, including schools and mosques and churches and homes, and exile almost a million people within a 12-month period. How did they do this if they were being attacked by massive armies from the outside? But once again, when we look at the facts, we realize that in 1947, the Jewish community, the Zionist community, had quite a substantial military force. They had a force of close to 40,000 armed men, well-trained, well-indoctrinated. My father was one of them. There was no equivalent on the Palestinian side. The Palestinians have never had a military force. To this day, the Palestinians have never had an army or a military force. There was no equivalent of the other side. The Arab armies, such as they were, didn't, didn't enter the war until late in 1940, uh, May of 1948. Much of the ethnic cleansing had already taken place. The war had been taking place for over six months by then. So, of course, this is a myth. 
This is a myth that nobody, nobody, nobody takes the time to investigate and question. But once again, the reality that in a 12-month period, so much was done exactly because that is what, that is exactly what was the purpose of these Zionist forces. To capture as much of the land as possible and get rid of as many people as possible. And that's exactly what they did. Would you hit the next one, please? You heard the story, Judith uh, related to the story about my mother. That's my mother. She's 86 now. She's still living in Jerusalem. She was born and raised in Jerusalem. And she used to tell me how when she was, a, she was young, she would walk around on a Saturday afternoon. And many of, the, many of the beautiful neighborhoods in Jerusalem, and I'm talking about the new Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that was built outside the city walls. Um, these, were these were Palestinian communities with beautiful homes. And she would walk around and she would see the families on a Saturday afternoon sitting under the, or by the lemon tree and so on. Yet, and then in 1948, she was living still in Jerusalem. These communities were forced to leave. Their homes were given to Israeli families. And she was offered one of these homes and like you heard, she refused. The thought of taking another family's home just did not sit well with her. And then she saw the looting, and, and she still, to this day, when she talks about it, you can see that she feels such a sense of shame. But what's interesting is that I remember hearing this story as a child many, many years ago and over a very long period of time. And it wasn't until I was actually working on the book and I spoke to her about this again that I realized why this story was bothering me all those years. Because the story was bothering me. I could, there was something about it that was troubling. And only now I, can, I realized it was troubling because it contradicted the national narrative. It contradicted what I learned in school. That the Arabs attacked, we won, they left, and we get the spoils. So what's wrong with taking their homes? If this is the truth, then there's no wrong in taking their homes. They attacked, and we won. It's fair enough. But once again, like I said, hearing the story in the back of my mind over and over and over again kind of troubled me. And this is exactly why. The truth lays in the personal story, not in the national narrative. Can you hit the next one, please? The, the title of the book is The General Son. And then the subtitle is Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. So the general son is a big part of who I am. And this is my father as a general. Now, after the state of Israel was established and the Jewish militia, the Zionist militia became the Israeli army, he remained as an officer and had a very long and, you know, uh, interesting military career. 20 years later, 1967, the drums of war were beating, he was already a general. And a lot has been written about what happened in 1967 and why the war broke out and who actually started the war and why. A lot of books have been written about this, movies have been made about this, and it's an interesting period. Now, just kind of to touch on the history, some of you I'm sure recall, the Egyptian uh, President Nasser decided to kick out the UN peacekeeping forces that were in the Sinai Peninsula that divided Egypt from Israel. And he, and he entered, and he entered against, against the uh, ceasefire agreement that existed between the countries, he entered Egyptian troops into the Sinai Peninsula. The generals saw this as a cause for war, as a legitimate cause for war. And they pushed for war. The Israeli cabinet, however, was, was not, well, they were hesitant. They were not so eager to start a war. And this tug of war began, tug of war began between these two groups. It was a very interesting difference between these two groups because the cabinet members were older. They were in their late 60s, early 70s, most of them. They were born in exile. They came with this whole uh, baggage of exile of pogroms and you know this is only 25 years after the Holocaust and they carried all this and they were worried that a war might lead to another Holocaust. The generals however were in their early 40s. They, almost all of them were born in Palestine. Almost all of them were members of the Zionist militia before the, in 1948 and they were what I like to call the new Jew that the Zionists wanted to create. Full of testosterone and very assertive and willing and ready to fight. And they created the Israeli army. Well, they wanted to fight. They saw, they saw an opportunity to start another war. Now, the myth that we're told about this, or the story, I should say, that we're told about the 1967 war is that once again, Israel was attacked 
by three massive armies intending to destroy it. And once again, miraculously, somehow, we, the Israelis, prevailed. Because we're smarter and because we're better trained and we're more motivated and, as we heard now recently, we're somehow uh, culturally uh, superior as well, perhaps. Who knows? But all of these reasons, for all these reasons, we prevailed and we defeated the Arab armies. Once again, when I was working on the book, I decided to look in, go into the Israeli army archives to learn about my father's career. Like I said, he had a very, very interesting military career. And I was interested particularly in reading the minutes of the meetings of the generals leading up to the 1967 war. Now, once again, a lot has been written about those meetings. So I wasn't expecting to find anything new because I'd read everything that was out there. But as soon as I began reading, I saw something that I'd not seen anywhere else. My father says this, and several of the other generals say this, in their attempt to convince the cabinet to start the war. And that is that the Egyptian army is not prepared for war. And therefore, we must attack now. In fact, they said, the Egyptian army needs at least a year and a half to two years before it, is, it will be prepared for war. So we have a tremendous opportunity now to once again, this will be the third time, to destroy the Egyptian army. And the fact that the Egyptian army brought their troops into Sinai and closer to us, closer to Israel, only makes it easier for us to destroy them. Not only are they not talking about an existential threat, they're not talking about any threat. They're talking about an opportunity, a military opportunity to once again defeat the Egyptian army. So once again, the myth fizzles away. The generals, of course, won the day. The government gave them the okay to start a preemptive strike against Egypt. The Egyptian army was decimated in a couple of days. The Sinai Peninsula was conquered once again. The Gaza Strip was conquered. And the generals wanted more. The generals wanted more. They wanted the West Bank, which was a sore spot for them because in 1948, they wanted to take it. They were young commanders in 1948, and they wanted the West Bank then. But for political reasons, Israel decided not to take it. Well, here was their opportunity, and they took the West Bank. And they'd wanted the Golan Heights for a long time, too, because it's high up above the Galilee, and it's, you know, there's lots of water there, and they took that as well. And there was a lot of ambition, too. The generals, the northern commander wanted the Golan Heights. The central commander wanted, you know, they all wanted the laurels of victory. They had no doubt that they were going to be victorious. In six days, in six days, the Israeli army defeated and destroyed three Arab armies, conquered the West Bank, the Golan Heights, the Sinai Peninsula, the Gaza Strip, killed over 15,000 Arab soldiers, at a loss of 700 soldiers to the Israeli army. 15,000 to 700, that's quite a ratio. And all this was done in six days as Arab armies were attacking them? Also attacked USS Liberty and killed 30, 30, 30, 30. True. 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 That's another one of those stories that nobody talks about, the, Liber the USS Liberty, that's right. So, again, the myth fizzles away once you actually take a look at the facts. Now, my father did something very interesting. After the war was over, at the very first meeting of the generals, the very first weekly meeting, he stood up and he said, now we have an opportunity to solve the Palestinian question. We can now offer the Palestinians a state in the West Bank and Gaza. If we do this, this will be the first Arab state with which Israel will have a peace agreement. It'll be a bridge for peace agreements with the other Arab countries, since Palestine, of course, was always a central issue. And we can go on living, you know, being the democratic Jewish state that we want it to be. And as he was saying this, a massive settlement project and an ethnic cleansing project began in the West Bank. Hundreds of thousands were thrown out. Towns and villages and cities were destroyed, and new towns were being built. And 
highways and so on and infrastructure to bring Israelis into the West Bank. Just as Israel had done after 1948, destroying Palestinian towns and villages, changing the names and building towns and villages for Israelis, the same thing was done in the West Bank after 1967. For Israel, this meant the job was done. In essence, what they did was they erased Palestine off the map. I always, I always like to show this picture. This is the victory lap. These are all the generals standing after the war, young, you know, victorious. And in the center is Alman Shazar, who is the president of the state of Israel. You know, Israel has a president as kind of a symbolic figure, somebody who used to be a, you know, something important in his lifetime. Uh, and you see the old generation and the new generation. And this new generation of generals is often referred to as the silver tray upon which the land of Israel was given to the Jewish people. Because from that point on, the entire land of Israel was under Jewish control for the first time after 2,000 years and only 25 years after the Holocaust. Historically, from a, Jewish, from a Zionist perspective, this is unbelievable, unprecedented. But in fact, this is what they did. Palestine was erased completely from the map, and Israel was in completely over the entire map. This was the objective. This was the name of the game. Erasing Palestine, getting rid of the people, and de-Arabizing the country. De-Arabizing the country is what was left to do. That's why when people talk about the possibility of Israel somehow giving up the West Bank for a Palestinian state, if it wasn't so sad, it would be funny. It shows a complete misunderstanding of the objective of Zionism and the Jewish state, and the Zionist state. Because conquering the land was the first objective. Getting rid of the people, and then de-Arabizing. And when I say de-Arabizing the country, this country has a 1,500-year-old history of Arab and Muslim rule. It was an Arab and a Muslim country more than it was anything else in history. So that has to be destroyed. Monuments have to be destroyed. Names have to be changed. The history has to be rewritten to connect once again King David to today's Israel and completely disregard the fact that this is, in fact, an Arab country, that it is in fact in the center of the Arab world, and that in fact over half of the population are Arabs. Now, after my father retired from the military, he did something even more stunning. He dedicated the rest of his life to the creation of a Palestinian state and peace with the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. and. He advocated for equal rights for the Palestinians who are Israeli citizens. Two things which are yet to be achieved. Now, in the mid-1970s, the Palestinian leadership, the PLO, this started contacting my father and others, or Evneri and others, people who are like that, in order to begin a dialogue. And that is really when the notion of the two-state solution was put together. These were Yasser Arafat's top, uh, Arafat's top people, his, 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 his advisors and his ambassadors and so on. In this picture is my father with uh, Dr. Issam Sartawi, who was the Palestinian ambassador, the PLO ambassador to Paris. He was later killed in 1983. And this dialogue went on between official representatives of the PLO and on the Israeli side, these were renegades. These are people who, who used to hold you know, high, high office of one kind or another, and they were Zionist Israelis. But the Israeli government refused, refused to take part in any of this. Only in 1993, only in 1993, did the Israeli government agree to finally begin negotiating with the Palestinians. What happened? What, what changed? Well, what changed was they, they, they achieved, they accomplished their mission of making the conquest of the West Bank irreversible. By 1993, 
the Israeli government knew for certain that a Palestinian state could not be established in the West Bank. The settlements were there, billions were invested, the entire Jordan River Valley was, was settled with, with villages and, and kibbutzim and things like that. There are major cities already built in the West Bank. Entire East Jerusalem was being, was taken over by Israel. There was no place anymore for a Palestinian state to be established. And that is when Israel said, okay, we will begin negotiations. So they allowed Arafat to come, misleading him into thinking that they were really intending to make peace and basically trying to force him to sign an agreement that would, that would complete his surrender. But once again, when we hear people still talking about the notion that somehow there could be an Israeli government that would give up the West Bank for a Palestinian state, like I said, if it wasn't so sad and tragic, it would be funny. Because as we look at the 65-year history of the State of Israel, it is absolutely clear that this can never happen. Now, later on in the year 2000, you may, I'm sure you recall, President Clinton invited uh, Barack and Arafat to, to Camp David to somehow solidify a peace agreement. Or so he said. What they tried to do is force Arafat once again to surrender, which he would not do. So they came out of Camp David and President Clinton said, Arafat gave, gave some, Barack gave more. In other words, this is Arafat's fault. And from that moment on, for the last four years of his life, he was vilified, and eventually Arafat died with Israeli tanks surrounding his office under siege. But the myth that we're, that we're always told is that the Palestinians are not willing to make concessions. And that is the problem. I think Mitt Romney just, uh, alluded to this as well in that little secret tape that was recorded. The problem is the Palestinians. They just don't want peace. Yasser Arafat was willing to give up almost 80% of his homeland and the right of the Palestinian refugees to return to their homeland and be compensated, all for the sake of peace. What he wouldn't do is he wouldn't go beyond, he wouldn't go, you know, less than 20%. He wouldn't give up the West Bank and the Gaza. That he couldn't do. They want him to give up even more. They want him to sign a surrender agreement, and he wouldn't. It's not the Palestinians that aren't willing to make concessions. It's Israel that's incapable of making concessions because concessions on the land are impossible from a Zionist perspective. The whole name of the game is taking the land and making it ours. And this is exactly the process that took place. Please. Now, once again, like I said, the book goes in and out of my own personal family's history and the history of the state of Israel and how the two are related. This is a picture of my niece, Madar. And on September the 4th, 1997, she was killed. Two young Palestinians blew themselves up in Jerusalem, took their own lives and several Israeli, the lives of several Israelis, including her. She was 13 years old. So when a 13-year-old little girl that you know and love gets killed like this, you know, you don't really know what to do. You don't know what to think. You don't know what to feel. You don't know how you're going to get back to life after that. Now, she was a granddaughter of a famous general. So this was big news. On top of that, she was also the granddaughter of Mr. Peace with Palestine. And now look what they did to him. Look what they did to his granddaughter. My, my father had already passed away by then. So this was, even, this was big news. And when I landed, in, uh, in, when I arrived in Jerusalem, my sister's house on the ground, I, could also, I saw the, the morning paper, and on the front page it already said the granddaughter of General Peled was killed by Palestinians. And my sister's apartment was packed with mourners, of course, people who came to express their sorrow, but also reporters, endless stream of reporters. And when, after the funeral, she came out to greet and see everybody. She said two things that put me on a path, and I think it put her on a path, and many of us kind of helped us to wrap our heads around this unspeakable tragedy. The first thing she was asked, of course, is about revenge and retaliation. And the comment that she made was, no real mother would want this to happen to another mother. Don't talk to me about revenge. Motherhood is a uniting force. 
It cuts through religion. It cuts through any differences that might exist between us. And if she's anything above all, is she is a mother. She's got three other boys, wonderful boys. And the second thing she said was, my government is responsible. My government brought these two young men to such a level of despair that they would take their own lives and take the lives of other innocent people, including a 13-year-old girl. The, the brutal oppression under which the Palestinians have to live because of us is the cause of this. That is why this is happening. If we want this to happen, we have to lift the oppression. As long as Palestinians are denied hope and denied freedom and denied water and denied their land and their homes, this will continue to happen. I point a finger at my own government. And interestingly enough, Bibi Netanyahu, who's today prime minister, was prime minister then as well. He also used to be a close personal friend of my sister because they went to school together in Jerusalem. That's a whole other side story. So then I came back, you know, the seven days of mourning that we Jews uh, keep, you know, were over and I had to come back. I lived here in America already and you have to go to work the next day and how do you do this? But somehow what my sister said put me on a path and I decided, okay, it's, it's time to do something. Because she became very outspoken. And her husband, Rami, became very outspoken, as some of you, I think, know, some of you have heard him here, about the need for reconciliation and the need to allow the Palestinians their rights and freedoms. I was lucky enough that in San Diego I met a group of people. It was a, it was a Jewish-Palestinian dialogue group. It took me some time to find them, and it took me some time to understand what I was going to do. And what was interesting was, I was 39 years old, I was here in the United States, and that was the very first time I ever met Palestinians. I grew up in Jerusalem. I was born and raised in Jerusalem, a mixed city. The first time I ever sat with Palestinians in a normal setting as completely equal people was here in the United States. Because even though Jerusalem is, you know, so-called united and so on, it's completely segregated. So an Israeli boy does not meet Palestinians. I mean, you might see them doing landscaping or, you know, washing dishes. And then I began hearing all these stories that I'd never heard before. This was a dialogue group, so it was not about, you know, accusing or arguing. Everybody told their story. And I'm sitting with Palestinians and they're telling me about forced exile and about massacres and all these things that we don't do. We Israelis don't do these things. We're a moral people, we're a moral army, we've made mistakes, we're not perfect, but basically we don't do these things. And my good fortune was that I was around a group of people, mostly Palestinians, who helped me go through this transformation. It's like learning, I don't know, it's like having your tooth pulled out, teeth pulled out without anesthesia. It's so painful. You suddenly learn that everything you know is not true. And coming from my background with my family history, that was very painful. But they were very gracious and very generous in the way they kind of led me through this. And I'm, you know, I'm forever grateful to that Palestinian community in San Diego for, you know, carrying me along. It took several years. The way now I talk about it like it was easy, but it was very difficult and it took a very long time. And then I became active. And then I started visiting Palestinian communities inside Israel, and I would visit the West Bank, and I began learning more and more about the issue. Would you hit the next one, please? And as I traveled to the West Bank, I would see this. If you've been to Kalandia or any of the major checkpoints, you see the sign. It's about the size of one of these walls. It's a massive sign. And as you can see, it's white letters over a red background, which usually means danger. And of course, it's in Hebrew. And what the sign says is that this road leads to Area A, which is under Palestinian control. And entry to Israelis into Area A is forbidden. It's life-threatening, and it's a felony. And if you notice, there are two exclamation marks. So if you're not scared yet, the two exclamation marks will probably do the trick. Now you'll also notice that unless you can read Hebrew, this is, this is irrelevant. It's only true if you can read Hebrew. 
Now, if you see a sign like that, and you have any sense at all, you turn around and go home. Who in his right mind would see a sign that says danger, firing zone, and walk right into it? My good fortune was that I don't have that kind of sense, and that I have many friends who don't have that kind of sense, and we went right through. And I've been going right through that, these checkpoints and right through that sign every single time I go visit my friends on the other side of the wall. And what's interesting is I always see the same thing. From the very first time all the way to today, it's been several years, every time I cross that, that wall, every time I cross the sign, I see the exact same thing. I see traffic jams. I see children going to school, which is probably the most common sight in Palestinian areas, the children coming and going to school. I see people going to work. I see shops. I've yet to see the Palestinians that want to kill me. I've yet to see the Palestinians ready with machine guns and tanks and F-16s ready to bomb me because I'm an Israeli. I'm yet to, I've yet to see that. And I know that many other Israelis who do this haven't seen it either. And with time, I began to realize this sign has nothing to do with security. The wall has nothing to do with security. The massive armed Israeli forces along the road have nothing to do with security. The terrorizing and harassment that Palestinian Israelis go through when they go through Tel Aviv airport, the humiliating process that they have to go through, they have to endure every time they decide to leave and go overseas, has nothing to do with security. It has everything to do with racism, with hatred, and with a deep desire to keep us apart, to keep me privileged and them with no rights. That's the name of the game. That's what it's all about. And that's the purpose of the sign. Can you hit the next one, please? Can, can you read that? Can somebody read that for me? Legitimate and in full accordance with the principle of international law. This describes the Palestinian struggle. Because that is exactly what Israel is. Now in this picture I stand with my friend Jamal, who sat in Israeli prison for many, many years. In fact, he was given a life sentence, but he was exchanged with, in one of the prisoner exchanges between Israel and the PLO. And the reason he was given a life sentence is because he killed a soldier. He and three others there we are, uh, saw two young Israeli soldiers guarding a bank in Ramallah, of all things. And soldiers are usually fully armed, of course. And they approached them and they stabbed them to death with a knife. And for that, they were later on you know, beaten, tortured, and arrested, and given life sentences. But when I see the picture of the two of us standing side by side, I have to wonder, which one of us is really the terrorist? Because according to this, it's certainly not him. I, on the other hand, served in the Israeli army, an army of occupation, an army of oppression, an army whose sole purpose is to make sure that he does not have a state, he does not have rights, and he dare not resist. So yes, my army has uniforms and commanders and generals, but which one of us is really the terrorist? And finally, and this is also how the book ends, what do we do? I mean, how do two nations share a state? How do they share a country? Well, there are lots of examples. Look at uh, Switzerland. Look at Belgium. You know, these are multinational states. The Swiss are Swiss, the Belgians are Belgians, regardless of what you know, actual nationality they are beyond that. So there are plenty of examples of, nation, of, of states that have multinational nations within them. Once again, going back to this question, is one state the right thing? Is two states the right thing? Are three states the right thing? Somebody gave me something you know, about a confederation. 
The reality is that Israel had created a one state. The borders in terms of what, from Israeli perspective, are very clear. The borders of the state of Israel are the Jordan River on the east and the Mediterranean on the west. That's it. If you look at Israeli school books, if you look at weather maps, if you look at any official maps of the state of Israel, it is absolutely clear. There is no question in anybody's mind what the borders of the state of Israel are. That's it. So the notion that there could be as an Israeli government that would give up some of that is absolutely absurd. And Israel governs this one state very skillfully with three different sets of laws. You have the laws that govern people like myself, Israeli Jews, who can come and go and say what they please. Pretty much a democratic state for all, for, for all purposes. You've got the laws that govern the Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, and there are over 30 laws in the law books that discriminate them against them specifically, and you've got an entire culture of discrimination against them that is deep-seated and deep-rooted in Israeli society. And then you've got the laws that govern the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, and this is really at the pleasure of the Israeli army. If they want to destroy, they destroy. If they want to arrest and beat, they arrest and beat. If they want to torture, they torture. If they want to kill, they kill. And Palestinians have no recourse. This is the reality. There's an education system, the Zionist education system, like Judith alluded, my sister just wrote a book about it. She's an educator. That teaches racism in a very subtle way. There's a bureaucracy, an entire bureaucracy, that is dedicated to making life impossible for Palestinians through all kinds of restrictions and permits and, uh, and requirements that are absolutely uncalled for and unnecessary, but are all given and provided under the guise of security. And then you've got the Israeli army, which I like to refer to as one of the most, one of the best trained, best equipped, best fed terrorist organizations in the world. And yes, they have generals and they have nice uniforms, but their entire, their entire uh, purpose is terrorism. And just as one example, I'll give you one example, almost exactly four years ago, as Israel began its attack on Gaza, September the 27th, 2008, at 11.25 in the morning, what I refer to as the most shameful day in the Jewish history, the most shameful day in the history of the Jewish people. Israel began carpet bombing Gaza, and on the first day of a, what was to be a 21-day attack, they dropped 100 tons of bombs. Okay, a one-ton bomb will decimate an entire city block. Gaza is one of the most densely populated places in the world. 800,000 children live in Gaza. 11.25 is exactly the time when the morning school shift and the afternoon school shift change. So all the kids are in the streets. All the children are on the streets. That was the moment decided by the decision makers in Israel to begin the attack. This was the first day of a 21-day slaughter that had absolutely no justification. If that's not terrorism, I don't know what is. And this is how the state of Israel manages to control the different populations and somehow still keep up this very sweet liberal kind of face to everything. But we still have to figure out how we go from here. Well, let's look at what happened in South Africa. They got rid of apartheid. That is the example. What did they do in America? They had got rid of the racist laws that existed in the South. Did the whites in South Africa want this, like this? Absolutely not. Did the whites in the southern states in America, here in the United States want this or like this? No. It was not done by consensus. But Zionism, just like racism, has to go. The Zionist state... The Zionist state has to be replaced with a democracy. Equal rights. We have five and a half million Palestinians, about six and a half million Israelis. There's absolutely no reason in the world why they can't live together as equals. 
Now, when, often when Jewish people hear this, especially if they support Zionism and support the state of Israel, they go, see, you're talking about genocide. You're talking about another Holocaust. That's just an excuse. There's no reason to assume this is going to be violent. There's no reason for a transfer of power to be violent. Evil dictatorships can be, and evil regimes can be replaced by democracies without violence. It's happened before. There's no reason why it won't happen again. I just heard this thing today about the vast differences between Israelis and Palestinians, cultural differences, the cultural superiority of the Israelis. I've never heard such nonsense in my life. The two societies could not be more similar. Their languages are similar. Their religions are similar. More than half Israelis, half of almost, I'm sorry, more than half of all Israelis are descendants of people who came from the Middle East. They're descendants of Arab Jews who came from Iraq, who came from North Africa, who came from Yemen. Arab culture is part of who they are. When, Iraq, when Baghdad was being bombed, you had old, old Arab Jews from Baghdad and Israel crying that their city is being bombed. There are no differences. And the likelihood of, of both populations seeing their common cause and seeing their common goals as outweighing any differences that might, be between, might exist between them is far greater than anything else. And then young Palestinians and young Israelis can grow up and have a future and live in a real democracy and do great things because this is a beautiful country. And it's got a lot of possibilities. So the name of the game has to be democracy and equal rights, not anything else. All right, thank you all very much. The first one was, is the sale and purchase of land a viable function, and does it follow the rule of law? I'm assuming that means for Palestinian. I, um, and then, does Israel use the right of eminent domain, or is the land seized with no legal process? How strong is the opposition within Israel to what appears to be an impending attack on Iran by Israel? That's three questions, okay? Let's do one more. One more, okay. <laughs> is Bibi really serious about attacking Iran, or is this a sideshow in order to avoid dealing with the Palestinians? Okay. I'm saying I'm no legal expert, so I don't really know about this uh, imminent domain and sale of land and so on. So I'm not really not sure how to, I will say this, and I don't know if it answers the question or not, but in Israel, the land is all owned by the state. So there's no, in essence, there's no private property. When you buy land, you're actually leasing it from the state. So, and every 49 years, you have to lease it again for either 50 or either 49 years or 99 years. That's kind of how, how, how that works. So what they try to do, like after 1948, they passed a law that meant that all of the absentee property, absentee property is the property of the people who are thrown out and then left as absentee, is their absent somehow, um, was taken, was it, the law passed that made it permissible for the state to take over the land. Then they passed another law that made it illegal for the Palestinian refugees to return and claim their land. So that's how that works. I'm not, I don't know if that answers the question, but I'm, like I said, I'm no legal scholar. Is there opposition in Israel to an attack? You know, the whole, the, the, and, and is Bibi serious about the attack? Um, the whole Iran issue, in my opinion anyway, is a smokescreen. It's, it was designed very cleverly and it's used very cleverly by Netanyahu and his government to shift everybody's attention from Palestine to some other fictional threat. And it's been very successful. I mean, the United Nations General Assembly, nobody talked about Palestine. You know, everything was about Iran, Iran, the threat on Iran, attack Iran, the bomb Iran, don't bomb Iran. Thousands of political prisoners in violation of, of, of international law sit in Israeli prisons. Israel, Palestinian children get less water than Israeli children 
Palestinians are kicked off their homes and their land is being taken and their towns are being destroyed every single day. People are being killed, shot and killed in nonviolent protests in the West Bank every single week. How can you talk about this nonsense, though, when there's a threat of an Iran uh, nuclear, th the, the Iranian nuclear threat? And they managed to manipulate this. So I don't think he's serious. I think he would be politically insane to let go of this wonderful card. But as long as he can keep talking about an Iranian threat, people are not going to talk about Palestine. What's the point of attacking Iran? What would that give them? Politically, it gives them nothing. Militarily, it gives them nothing because there is no threat. And then he's going to have a problem. This way, he's got this issue. He's had it for several years, and I don't think he'll give it up. So I don't think he's serious about it. That's not to say that there is no possibility that uh, something might happen, but I can't, uh, I can't imagine that he would, he would do that. Um, and, you know, people in Israel are basically scared. I mean, what do people know? People know what they read, what they hear in the paper. Every day, the, the headline, somebody says something about Iran. The defense minister decided to say, uh, no, just a few weeks ago, and he, the defense minister goes back and forth supporting it and being against it, and supporting it and being against it. And so a few weeks ago, there was a headline saying, quoting him as saying, that the blade that rests on our, on our necks now is even sharper and more dangerous than the threat of 1967. So my first reaction was, he should read my book. <laughs> but, you know, anybody that's knowledgeable knows that there was no threat in 1967, but they want to create this tension that was, that bring back that tension of 1967 where people are actually afraid. Israelis in 1967 were scared to death. The generals didn't let on that this was going to be a, a very easy war. You know, people were actually afraid that there would be another Holocaust. And they're creating this fear again so that they can continue to, to talk about this threat. So I don't think it's a, it's a real threat, and I don't think Bibi would attack because it's too good of a political card to give up. More questions? Yeah. Okay. Do you think a one-state solution will work, given that 60 to 70 percent of Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs and Palestinians do not favor a one-state solution. How do you make this happen? That's one question, okay? Okay. Well, and the second one, the second one is similar, so I won't read it. Um, where did this land-grabbing, this is a biggie, racist Zionist philosophy come from? And where did the suicide bomber phenomenon come from? And... Whoa, let me write this down. <laughs> and how could you live your whole life in Israel, serve in the military, and not see what you now see? Oh, easy. Okay. Is that three good ones? Yeah, yeah, that's good okay. yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't know that uh, such a large number of Palestinians don't want this two-state solution. Uh, I talk to a lot of Palestinians, and I, don't, I haven't done any statistics, but a lot of Palestinians that I talk to realize and see no problem with it. So I don't think there's going to be that big of an opposition on the Palestinian side to this at all. There will be opposition, of course, on the Israeli side, because when you're privileged, you don't want to give up your privileges. You know, we, the Israeli Jews, are privileged in this society. And the privileges that are given to us by the state are part of the attempt to set us apart from the Palestinians. So if I break the law in Hebron, and a Palestinian breaks the exact same law in the exact same spot, the laws that govern the state of Israel, which are, you know, regular, you know, conventional law, applies to me. Israeli military law applies to the Palestinian. If I participate, or I should say when I participate in protests in the West Bank and I get arrested, everybody knows how it's going to end. I go home at the end of the day. I might get roughed up a little bit, you know, whatever, but at the end of the day, everybody knows I go home because I'm an Israeli Jew. Palestinian that gets arrested will be beaten, will be tortured, and will be kept in prison as long as the local commander wants him in prison. It could be a day, it could be a week, it could be a month, it could be a year, without charges and without a trial. And then six months later, I get a letter from the police saying that the case was closed because of something, some technicality. 
So Israelis are not going to want to give up this privilege, but I think whites in South Africa didn't want to give up their privilege, and whites in America didn't want to give up their privilege either, but they're going to have to. Things like this are not done as a result of a consensus. That's why there are pressures. That's why there's BDS. That's why there's a non-violent non resistance. That's why we have events like this. That's why more and more American Jews are breaking away from Zionism and coming and organizing events like this. And whether they like it or not, this is the transformation that's going to take place. People ask me, well, I'll tell you a little story. I was asked, um, I, sp I spoke at an eighth grade class. A friend of mine is a teacher of this really nice, special kind of a school where kids actually learn about stuff. So it's an eighth grade class, and they're learning about this issue. And they've been learning about it for a few weeks, and they wanted me to come and speak. And they took a poll among themselves asking how many of them think there will be a solution in their lifetime, a peaceful solution in their lifetime. These are eighth graders. They're 13 years old. 80% said no. So when I came to speak, I said, well, let's see if I can't change your mind, because it's all a question of what you know. And I explained to them about the similarities about the societies and all the possibilities that exist once the state of Israel is transformed into a democracy. If I didn't think this was possible in my lifetime, I wouldn't be doing this. If I wasn't completely confident that this is actually going to happen, I wouldn't be doing this. So Israelis aren't going to like it, but they don't need to like it. Um, you know, that's kind of the way these things are. But I think Palestinians, the, the, the impression that I have, and I'm there a lot, is that Palestinians actually do favor this. Okay, there's two questions here. One is about where did Zionist philosophy come from? Well, at the, in the turn of the 19th century, there was, you know, this uh, nationalism rose and all these little groups decided that they were going to become nations. And my grandparents were part of that. They were Jews and they were in Eastern Europe and they suffered from pogroms and they suffered from all kinds of, um, all kinds of discrimination and racism against Jews and anti-Semitism and they thought, well, maybe this is a good idea. And when Zionism began, you know, there was a whole scope of, of Zionisms. You know, there were Zionists that believed in a, in a democracy and that, that Jews and Arabs would live together. They didn't, in their wildest dreams, imagine that they would kick out people from their homes. And then there were other Zionists who later on became the mainstream Zionists, led by people like Ben-Gurion, who was Israel's first prime minister, that were ra radical, racist, and violent. And they won the day. And they gave the tone, and that's why Zionism is what it is today. Racist, violent, militant, and non-compromising. But that tone was given by Ben-Gurion and people around him. Um, so that's, that's where that came from. Um, and where did suicide bombers come from? I don't know that suicide bombing is a philosophy. I mean, there are five, million, five and a half million Palestinians who live inside of Palestine. There's probably another five or so that live outside of Palestine. That's 10 million people. There were less than 200 suicide bombers. So it's not like, you know, there's a rash, there's some kind of a, of a madness of suicide bombers among Palestinians. Let's put things in perspective. Um, and I don't know that there's a philosophy to it. I think when people are desperate enough and hopeless enough, they see their fathers being beaten and tortured, they see their sisters being shot and arrested, they see their homes being destroyed. They have no ability to go anywhere or buy food or provide water for their families or their, or their siblings. And they see this massive army that is relentlessly oppressing them and beating them. If there's no hope, there's no hope. So we do what we can, you know. But I think if we actually look at how many people actually did this, and I don't know a single Palestinian, and I know a lot of Palestinians, that thinks this was a good thing or supports it. So I think it's important to put the suicide bombing thing in, in proportion. Yeah. OK, I have four cards here that all kind of deal with something. So it's not really three questions. I'll just give okay. you a whole okay. series of topics. Um, are you saying that nothing will change unless there are changes in American policies and public opinion? 
What can we do in our U.S. communities to support a single democratic state in Israel? Hold on, hold on, slow down. Um, <laughs> slow how down. do we counter? The, <laughs> hold on, hold on. This hold on. is all part. Well, it's yeah, all. Yeah, but I gotta. You know. Oh, you gotta get them. Okay. So nothing will change <laughs> unless something changes in the U.S. What can we do? Yeah. Uh, what can we do? do uh, no, are you better. saying that nothing will change unless America? Okay. And what can we do in our communities to support a single democratic state okay. and to counter? No, what? That's fine. That's fine. Oh Go yeah, on. he wanted me to read them. I tried. Go on. <laughs> Go on. How, how do we counter the the uh, influence of APAC and other Jewish organizations over U.S. policies? Okay. And how do we convince Americans, I assume, who speak against Israeli policies to fight the false accusation of anti-Semitism? And what do you see as the U.S. collusion? with the current Zionist project, and who's actually calling the shots historically, the Zionist movement or the US government and big business? Those are all related. Okay, <laughs> wow, that's a lot of questions. Okay, well, nothing's gonna change until a lot of things change. I think, um, closer? Okay, I think nothing's gonna change until a lot of things change. So things have to change in this country, certainly, and they are changing in this country. Like I said, you know, I'm gonna be speaking right now, I'm booked through Thanksgiving, pretty much straight through. More than half of the events that I'm invited to speak at are organized by American Jews. So I see a very big change in, 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 in what's perceived to be you know, American, American Jewry. It's, not, it's, it's no longer this blind um, admiration for AIPAC and for Israel and for the whole Zionist thing. Jews are looking at the state of Israel and they say, well, we, this, is not, this does not represent us. This is not what we, you know, what we stand for. Thousands of political prisoners, torture, discrimination, this is not what American Jews stand for. So more and more American Jews are, are moving away from Zionism, and I think that's a very good thing. So that's changing already. I also think that, you know, certainly the United Methodists, the Presbyterian churches are doing a lot of work on this issue. And they're making big strides, and they're bringing about big changes. And I think the more, the more Americans see Jewish people criticize Israel, the more non-Jewish people will feel comfortable. And, this anti-Semitic thing, people ask me this all the time. They say, well, look, you can say this because you are you, but when we say it, they call us anti-Semitic. And my reply to that is, fine. I mean, they call me a self-hating Jew. I just got something that said I was self-hating Jew or that I hate Jews or something. Fine, I'll take that. Now, let's, let's talk about something else. Can you explain to me why Palestinian children get no water? Well, can you explain to me how you justify dropping 100 tons of bombs on children? Can you explain to me throwing people out of their homes and making them homeless? Can you explain to me taking kids, yanking kids out of their beds at 2 o'clock in the morning, throwing them in prison and torturing them? Can you explain all this to me? Perhaps I'm anti-Semitic. Now you explain all this to me. What does that make you? And this has to be the conversation. Calling people anti-Semitic is, is a very weak weapon. It's a very weak tool. It's all they've got. But when you actually look at it, it's completely meaningless. Because they do not have an answer for all those other questions. And that has to be the issue. They're the ones who have to explain. Not anybody, not you, not us. You have nothing to explain. These are legitimate questions. You supported, you danced, you celebrated when Israel was dropping hundreds of tons on bombs on 800,000 children. They were locked up in Gaza and had nowhere to go. You supported this. I'm anti-Semitic? What does that make you? You support a country that deliberately prevents children from access to water. Not to mention food and medicine and education and a home and freedom. You support that. What does that make you? How can you support this? This has to be the conversation. And I'm not suggesting it's an easy thing to do, but I am suggesting that this is how you counter APAC. 
And that's what you do here in the U.S. Because these are the conversations that APEC, these are the best excuses, these are the best thing APEC can come up with. They're talking about transforming Israel is anti-Semitism and it's calling for genocide. Who's talking about genocide? I haven't heard anybody suggest genocide. Of all the people that I've heard, and I've heard a lot of people talk about this trans transition, changing Israel from a Zionist state to a democracy. I've heard many people talk about, Ilan Pape who talks about it, many people talk about this. None of them, not a single one of them would support a violent uh, a transformation, transition. Not one would support violence. And violence is not needed. So that's how you combat APAC, and that, that's how you counter APAC, and that's how you convince Americans not to be afraid. Like I said, I'm not suggesting it's easy. When somebody comes back with this anti-Semitism thing, then people you know, pull back and they're afraid. And I can understand that. It's very hurtful. At the same time, there's a bigger issue here. So this may hurt our feelings for five seconds, but you know, let's continue the conversation. And that's what has to happen, and that's how you take over this APAC uh, nonsense. Um, the collision with Zionism is inevitable. Was it collision or collusion? Which way? <laughs> huh? Collusion. Oh, collusion, I'm sorry. Well, it, I think it's temporary. <laughs> It's temporary. I mean, America does, you know, politicians in America do what they have to do in order to get elected. Being pro-Zionist is part of what you have to do in America if you want a political career. Either you're the president or a council member of, you know, my, my city, Coronado. I mean, they're not even, you know, it's kind of a part-time job. That's, what they, that's, the name, that's the name of the game. That's the price of doing business. So I think the president cares more about health care than about Israel. So he's going to give money to Israel so they shut up and he can pass health care reform. This is how it is. This is politics in America. And that's why a second Obama term is not going to make the difference, any change. It's not going to be different on this issue. Because he doesn't care enough and because, you know, why bother? He's got nothing to gain. But it's going to start from the bottom. And once there's a lot going on, it's like I said to somebody earlier, it's like Vietnam. When American people decided it, enough is enough, Congress said enough is enough, and the President said enough, and that was it, and Americans were out of Vietnam. But it takes that kind of a movement. Um, and right now, it's true that on this issue, Israel calls the shots. Right now, when Israel says jump, the American politicians say how high, and then they move on to the next thing. But that's the price of doing business here in America if you want to be a politician. Is that it? I have one more question. Um, how has your book been received in Israel? <laughs> it hasn't been received in Israel. I don't think anybody in Israel uh, re read it. Um, you know, I've had several speaking events, and I've had a couple of book launches, but they were all on the other side. One was in East Jerusalem, one was in Ramallah, and so on. And so Israel ignores this completely, and that may change. I don't know, but I haven't had any, any response one way or the other from anybody in Israel about the book. That's it. Yeah, I, that is it um, for questions. Okay. It is not it for signing books. Oh, okay, no. <laughs> yeah, you, yes, we need to give this man an incredible amount of applause. <laughs>